Welcome everyone. Uh, sorry for the little delay there. Uh, hi, I'm Patty Favaza and um, welcome to the webinar on children's experiences of loss and grief uh, during a pandemic. Um, I uh, first wanna give a shout out and thank you to the center uh, and uh, for Karen and their team uh, for their support and their sponsorship of today's session. Um, thank you for, also to you for taking the time to join me today um, to talk about this important topic of children's experience of loss and grief during a pandemic. Uh, the idea for this session came about um, actually a year ago uh, after I had gotten many requests from around the world uh, for copies of an article I wrote years ago called Loss and Grief in Young Children written with uh, my colleague, Dr. Leslie Munson. Uh, it was based on our experiences of, uh, as teachers of young children uh, with uh, disabilities, many of whom spoke of loss or demonstrated actually behaviors that signaled a grief response to some of the many transitions that they were experiencing in big and small ways. So while loss and grief, uh, we wanna recognize right on the front end of today's session, uh, is typically associated with the death of a loved one or someone you know, uh, but for the purpose of today's session, uh, we're focusing the loss and grief responses associated with the pandemic. I hope before you joined, you were able uh, to uh, look at some of the PowerPoints or maybe print them out, uh, the PowerPoint handout, uh, as well as there are three articles that you can go back and read further about it and an extensive um, resource list that you could tailor to your own needs. Um, so before we start, I hope I can hear you because I couldn't earlier uh, hear anyone. Um, I wanted to um, actually ask um, a little bit about you, if you could give me a sense of who you are. Um, so to do this, let's see uh, if I can remember this right. I think if you hover on your name and you'll see the dot, 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 uh, if you click on that and rename, if you could just write in there, uh, well, you could leave your first name in there, but uh, tell me what your role is. Are you one of these that are on the screen here? A teacher, an assistant teacher, special services such as OTPT, um, uh, counselor, social worker, and so on. Um, if you have trouble doing that, I think you could also do that in the uh, chat box. So... Can you give a shout out? Uh, let me know what are what is your role? Like Sheila and Erica and Janelle, um, looking at all these names, Jessica, Emily, Cynthia. Hmm. I guess another way we could do this, oh, I see a couple in the chat box, uh, is you could just unmute yourself and tell me. Uh, okay, I see a few here, special ed preschool teacher. Uh, Pre-K teacher, awesome, I'm looking at these in the chat box. Um, anybody else, there we go. Pre-K -pre uh, Janelle teacher aide. Um, anybody else wanna join in? It's, I'm just reading these from the chat box. Oh, oh, here we go. Program coordinator and therapist, awesome. Bilingual parent educator, wow, that's awesome. All right. Um, well, regardless of what your primary role is, um, I hope in this webinar you'll discover a new or different way to frame a situation um, or find a new resource uh, for the children in your personal and professional um, world that you move in. So who am I? That's me down there on the left-hand side. Um, and these are some of the hats I have worn uh, in the field of early childhood special education. Uh, I've undertaken research and teaching of children with disabilities, as well as teaching adults as a professor, um, but children with disabilities uh, in several states, Louisiana, Tennessee, um, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and other countries, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Kenya, Tanzania, Romania, Cyprus, uh, Greece, Turkey, and so on. Um, so as you can imagine, I have a very uh, kind of uh, multicultural lens in which I view things, having worked with children with physical and health impairments, emotional and behavior challenges, intellectual disabilities, and learning disabilities, primary, primarily very young children, pre-K, uh, lower elementary up to grade two. 
um, many of them whom express loss associated with either a health issue or a significant transition that they were facing um, or trauma in their lives. Um, so um, this is kind of the context of where this um, webinar came from and with my colleagues writing about it a few years ago. Uh, my most uh, cherished uh, role is actually the last one uh, listed there. I'm a mom. Those are uh, my husband and I are proud parents of four children. Um, and I love this picture. My mom had a thing about dressing them all alike, uh, but they're now all in their 20s uh, and on their own different paths as they launch into adulthood. Uh, but some of them are adopted. Uh, some of them are dual language learners. Some of them have disabilities and childhood PTSD from their early life experiences. So basically my own uh, teaching and research as well as our own children uh, afforded me both in professional and personal life, um, a front row seat to the many losses uh, experiences uh, of children and their families as they navigated their own personal uh, journey. So our objectives for today um, are here. We're going to talk about identifying loss experiences associated with the pandemic, uh, gain understanding about the concepts of loss and grief, uh, learn about children's responses and their task as they process um, grief, and consider or hear about strategies and resources to support children in this unique moment. So let's see, um, we're gonna start with kind of this basic, um, uh, conceptualization of loss. And I hope what you see from this, that it is intentionally broad in scope and has particular relevance to our lives during a pandemic. A sense or feeling of loss might occur in a circumstance or experience that takes away something that is familiar or significant to a person, so to a child, that might shift their identity, their sense of security, or their relationships. And of course, it's best understood through the eyes of the person experiencing it. Um, so I think this is pretty relevant to this new normal as we see. Um, I'll be honest with you, I thought a year ago uh, that we wouldn't see any of these things. And yet uh, it is still for many of us, uh, our normal, our everyday experiences have been upended, if you will, leaving many of us to adjust to things over and over again as uh, they change. Uh, the new normal of repeated hand washing, still social distancing, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and in many places still wearing masks. Most importantly, how do we support children as they continue to make this major pivot, this major transition in their lives? It's a topic I think that is important, that merits careful thought, as we recognize that all significant transitions have a potential loss component and thus can be viewed, if you will, as a dress rehearsal for the very next loss experience, the very next transitional moment in their lives. So if we can foster a healthy ways for children to talk about it, to come to terms with it, it will likely improve their capacity to respond to future losses in healthy ways. So let's first take a step back and talk about examples of loss that children uh, have experienced during the pandemic. Um, since we have a small group of people here, I think we're gonna try and do this without breakout rooms. Um, so I might ask you if you could, uh, to answer this question, uh, just turn your mic on uh, if you wanna give an answer to this. Uh, so children's losses, um, uh, loss is the term we use to talk about feelings of sadness or frustration, anxiety, um, or the absence of a significant person or change in any aspect of their lives. And I'm curious, what are things that you have seen? What are examples of children's losses related to the pandemic? And I'll just ask you, uh, just um, if you wanna offer a response to this, it'd be great. Uh, we could get two or three of these examples uh, from you. Um, just unmute your mic and go for it. Hi, um, this is Cynthia. I'm sorry, I have my camera off. Um, I don't have my camera working today. Anyway, um, a, a lot of variety from losing the routine uh, to losing family members. Like it's really a huge range of losses that I have witnessed. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. 
Yeah, I've seen that too. Anybody else? Can't tell. Okay, so someone's speaking. I see you speaking, but I can't hear you. Emily, um, you need to unmute. Thank you. Yes, hi. So um, uh, my children are in uh, the foster care system, a lot of them. And so because of that, they have lost the ability to go out and have visits with some of their parents and really get those services that they need. Wow, that's really important. Yeah, uh, and a huge loss. Thank you, Emily. Anybody else? We I think we have time for one more. Somebody want to jump in there? No. Okay, I'm gonna go on. Um, well, uh, this might look familiar. Um, you know, there you might uh, have sent, sent, uh, seen or heard of children who are. Uh, for example, uh, have experienced a loss of sleep, a loss of appetite uh, and energy, uh, a loss of their current levels of functioning, either in behavior or in their academic uh, endeavors, uh, a loss of ability to concentrate. Uh, so I'll give you three quick examples of things that I've seen among te that teachers have shared with me and parents. Uh, meltdowns uh, because most or all of their summer activities were canceled. That long awaited trip to Disneyland summer camp, for example, or some families have talked about they had to actually move out of their house and shelter with uh, grandparents uh, to uh, help support grandparents. So uh, their children were missing their neighborhood friends. They were missing just being in play groups uh, and space in their own home. Um, uh, also, uh, of course, sadness and uh, difficulty when not being able to see their friends, their cousins, um, and other extended uh, family members. So many, uh, it's across the spectrum, all kinds of losses that children have experienced. So I'll ask the same question. How about examples of uh, losses that were experienced by parents and teachers? Um, if you have examples of that, uh, somebody want to jump in and give us a couple of examples. What have you seen or heard or even yourself experienced? Many parents lost their jobs and therefore the kids had to stay home. Exactly. So they lost income. Exactly, so that financial stability, exactly. Thank you. Anyone else? looking through the list here. No? Well, this also may look familiar to, to you. Uh, many parents and teachers talked about loss of freedom, loss of loved ones. Uh, someone just pointed out uh, loss of financial stability um, in their home when they uh, lost their jobs. Um, a sense of isolation and social withdrawal. So uh, loss of their uh, supports that they had uh, in the workplace, in their neighborhood, in their families. Uh, I heard this from many, many parents as well as teachers. Uh, one of the things that was upsetting to hear uh, to me from teachers, their loss of joy about teaching, their loss of confidence in teaching when things had to shift to another modality of uh, interacting with children. Uh, their loss of connection with the children uh, that they taught. Um, one teacher said to me, their loss of calm. Uh, she said, I'm usually not an anxious person, but now I find I have to calm myself every day just to get through my day. Um, so, so many changes. Uh, some people, again, like children, lost um, their living situation and had to relocate um, just to adjust to some of the other changes in their lives. So this is no small thing when we think about uh, the ripple effect it had uh, not only in children, but also those who are tasked with caring for them, parents and teachers. Uh, losses associated with personal and professional uh, life uh, are experienced by people of all ages, as we know. Uh, there were missed graduation, canceled sports and performances, activities, postponed weddings and vacations, separations from families and friends. 
uh, if I had to put them all into, um, into my researcher hat on and doing content analysis, it seemed like they fell into these three broad areas. There was a loss of the familiar, the loss of the familiar freedom and life that you had and so many things that fell within that. There was a loss of a sense of safety among children, but also even adults. Uh, and this last one, a loss of predictability um, as things continually change. Um, we could look at them in that way or frame them in that way. Uh, this is co a common way we frame uh, types of loss that children and adults alike experience. Remembering that every change or transition has the potential to shift or alter that person's identity, security, and relationships. So this could happen in a very typical events or transitions, such as when you change schools, when you change teachers, when you change friendship groups among children, uh, there might be a loss and grief response to that. Uh, shift or that transition. It could also happen with what we would consider happy events or transition, but I think we don't often think about that. So if you can imagine a marriage, a birth, an adoption of a child, a graduation, uh, there may be a sense of loss associated with these uh, quote unquote happy events as we step into a new chapter, letting go of some of the aspects or all of the aspects of the previous chapter. In addition, of course, there are unexpected events and what I call non-events. And so these are anticipated transitional moments that a person actually didn't experience at all, or it was experienced in a different way. So think of all those children who went to kindergarten online and they didn't actually get to walk into a building or go into first grade, didn't actually get to walk into a classroom or some um, programs, they have kindergarten graduation or other rituals and traditions, uh, or even just something as common as celebrating one's birthday with one's friends um, that didn't happen or didn't happen as planned. So these are all different types of losses that children can experience. And just like that conceptualization of loss, uh, this is a conceptualization of grief that is intentionally broad in scope and has relevance during the pandemic. Grief is a process that results in a permanent or temporary change in routines, relationships. It can lead to discomfort uh, and pain and impacts um, a child's thoughts, their feelings and their behaviors. I think if any of you uh, could think back to your own childhood, of a change that you had to go to through, whether it was permanent or temporary, uh, that caused a little bit of discomfort for you. Um, I was asking uh, a group of teachers and they all could rattle these off. Uh, and even within my own uh, family. Um, and I'll tell you too, very quickly at age six, I was in love with my teacher and I absolutely did not want to leave that teacher and go to the next teacher, even though of course, that's the routine and that's what should happen. Uh, but I was devastated. I was so attached to my first teacher. At age eight, we had to move to a new town, a new school. And so all of my friends changed, all of my comfort in the school that I was used to changed. So all of us have these as a part of your childhood. Many, many transitions that you went through as a child um, transitioning you. And any one of them could have come with a grief uh, process. So stated another way, grief is a multi-component process. Uh, as we process information, as we process our feelings when we're making those kinds of changes. So I would bet you already know this, by the time you've reached adulthood, you've had many loss experiences associated with transitions in your life. Um, and just like all of these things that you see uh, on this particular slide, I can include any and all of these, but let's refresh our memory on what uh, does grief look like. So I'm gonna present, uh, kind of try and do this quickly, um, the three different ways you can think about uh, loss and grief process. Uh, and these are not mutually exclusive, but I think when I work with families and children in particular, I need to keep in mind the developmental perspective. I need to um, remind myself of, uh, what are stages or aspects uh, as that someone may, may go through as they are experiencing uh, loss and grief. And then in particular, uh, 
what am I looking at when I see children's responses? And then what are the tasks that they're working on? So uh, let's look, take a look at these. Um, take a little whirlwind tour here. Uh, so you see uh, there's a citation at the bottom. And in fact, I'm pretty sure this was one of the PDF from the Doogie Center was one of your uh, handouts. So you could go and read more about this. I only put two developmental ages up here. Uh, very young children, uh, and these are age approximations. But I want you to draw your attention to the side where it says response. Uh, what you should see from this is there is an overlap, and I'm sure you could find them, words in the, uh, that, uh, like anxiety that occur for a two to four year old and anxiety down there for a five to eight year old. So you'll see as you look across those on the right hand column, things that are common across those, but there are also differences and they also may look very different. So of course, a young child, two to four years of age may be confused or not understand. Why did the routine change? They're uh, focused on the immediate observable change. Parents and kids are home. I can't go see my friends at my play date or some activity that they typically do uh, is no longer happening. Uh, very concrete. Uh, as a child uh, and has maybe many questions they ask over and over again to check in and say, is today the day uh, we're going to do um, the same activity that they were used to in their routine. But if you bump that up a little for a child five to eight, uh, this child is also asking questions, but they are um, obviously uh, may move to asking deeper questions. How, um, the how, the why, the when, uh, are questions that they would focus on because they have higher cognitive functioning, they have a sense of time. Notice on there, they might also have a concern about safety where for a younger child, that may not come across as something that they think about. In both instances, you may see regressions uh, or changes uh, in that child's behavior. And uh, the child, older child may actually express physical complaints uh, it doesn't mean that a younger child may not be experiencing that, but they may not be uh, have language to express that. So that's one way to think about it. And you certainly could read more about this in that handout from the Doogie Center. This has uh, been around for a very long time, actually since 1969, uh, but it is continually looked at over and over again. Um, as another way to think about uh, grief, it's called the stages theory or stages approach, uh, developed by Dr. Kubler-Ross, um, uh, a, a Swiss American psychiatrist, medical doctor, researcher, and author on uh, death and dying. When she first discussed uh, her uh, theories of stages of grief, and while uh, Kubler-Ross believed that these were universal, uh, she also recognized that there were individual variations in this. And since its development, uh, actually many people have applied this not to a just a, an experience of death, uh, but have applied it to many of the transitions that people go through in life. Um, I think this is helpful if you're someone who likes to see a structure applied to the messiness of grief. I think this helps do that. It also, uh, I think, is helpful for one to identify uh, name the things that they are doing and feeling. If you're someone who likes to be able to look at that either in yourself or others uh, and try and identify that. And I think it's also helpful because um, I think you can see a usefulness or a potential benefit of each of these uh, stages. So I'm not gonna read what's in blue. I put those in there so you could see an example of each of these uh, phases. Uh, these are things that children have said to me or to teachers or to parents uh, that represent uh, the stages that are delineated on the left. So temporary uh, shock uh, it, uh, would be an example of denial. Uh, this very first stage, I really believe is a protective response um, that you might wanna ignore the situation. Uh, so you might see a child shutting down the conversation or overly plugged in uh, or binge watching. And I can honestly attest that was me uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. I could list all the shows I binge watched, really was so overwhelmed by what was coming at us and trying to understand what was happening. So uh, anger, another um, 
uh, aspect of a grieving process uh, that really provides an emotional, if you will, an emotional outlet. Some people think of anger as kind of this outward suit of armor, that that's what you see on the outside, but uh, what is on the inside is probably, and that uh, that's acceptable maybe to express anger or frustration, but maybe not acceptable to express what's on the inside of that. Uh, and that might be fear, that might be pain um, that a child is going through. So I think it's helpful to think about that. Bargaining, making personal promises to uh, yourself, uh, to others, uh, or to a higher power. Um, and so you see an example of a child's comments there uh, in bargaining. Um, I actually think this may lead to some self-reflection and some sense of calm, um, you know, or sense of control uh, that I'm doing something about it. I'm, um, you know, really reflecting. Some people call it praying. Um, bargaining. Um, and so uh, it may serve a purpose of self-reflection. Depression, we're probably all familiar with what that looks like. Um, and so what we think of during the pandemic for children is we might have a reactive depression. So react to the current situation. I'm so upset about uh, missing the bus driver or missing the assistant teacher in the classroom. We also might have a child that expresses what we would call uh, preparatory uh, depression. So preparing for the future, I bet we're not having any more class parties. I bet we're never having Halloween like we used to. Um, so really projecting ahead of time. Uh, it really serves to be more present to the loss experience as maybe panic uh, subsides or anger subsides. And we, um, we may see a child retreat into themselves processing the events. Acceptance, I think, is the most misunderstood um, stage listed here. Some people think, oh, it's all better now, or it's a happy uh, moment, and it really is not. Uh, actually, you could still have a sense of loss here, uh, but what you might see is someone no longer resisting the new reality, and so there are some quotes there that we've heard from uh, children. Um, so what you might see is uh, they are mobilizing, they are reorganizing, they are reframing uh, their response to the new normal. Uh, and doesn't mean they don't still feel some of the things that they, all this uh, feelings that they might have of loss, uh, but uh, making a small step forward. I added the last one down here uh, and it, you notice it says David Kessler, I'm reading this right now and you can go to grief.com. But he, uh, in 2020, came out with a book, uh, Finding Meaning, the Sixth Stage of Grief. Uh, he is a, uh, known to be an expert uh, in his professional and personal life on grief and loss. Um, what I like about it, what I'm reading it, is I think it really does uh, take this idea of moving forward um, to heart and integrating that loss in meaningful ways as you move forward in your life. And so examples uh, of that are, are down there below. And I've actually heard people do this. I am no longer complaining about teachers. Now I offer support. I'm volunteering in school. So they're making meaningful choices of what to do, something to do to actively engage and be an agent of change uh, and finding meaning uh, as they move forward. So excellent read there. And there's a citation also at the bottom if you wanna read more about these stages. Uh, the the um, third way to think about, and uh, it's probably one of my most favorite ways, uh, is this one, children's response and task. And so the left-hand column we've already talked about, children have emotional response, a cognitive response, a behavioral response. So I won't read through those, but again, the, those in blue are what children might say. Uh, but what you should pay attention to is uh, the work that's at hand, rolling up their sleeves and doing these tasks. Uh, and these are the tasks that children um, take on as they are going through a loss and grief process. And I, I feel like as a caregiver, uh, that's our role to assist them in this. So finding understanding uh, is one task um, that children, uh, the very first task, finding a way to explain and talk about what has happened uh, and why it's happened at their uh, age level, of course, developmentally appropriate. And very often it's repeated conversations uh, about to help in their understanding of that. 
there's an actual process of grieving. Uh, they need self-expression, appropriate, healthy ways to self-express. And so it is our job to help identify ways to do that. Commemorating, uh, so important that they honor the event or a person. Um, and so uh, finding ways to uh, commemorate what has happened. Uh, parents and teachers alike have told me about so many things, memory boxes, planting trees, uh, creating a capsule of uh, last year, a time capsule. So thinking uh, very thoughtfully about how can you commemorate a, a person's life or the event uh, that we have all been through. And then moving forward, what are concrete strategies that they can latch on to for next steps of achieving uh, and moving forward uh, through the grieving process to process their loss? One parent told me, and in fact, I love this so much, uh, their teacher I know took this on, that she had on the refrigerator visual supports of uh, what, uh, how do you feel? And the child could identify sad, worried, frustrated. And then on the next side, what can you do about it? All kinds of choices of what the child could do to help them work through that moment of uh, of their uh, challenges, their emotional challenges. So in essence, it was a to-do list, a great model for here's a problem you have and connecting that to uh, um, a, um, a solution uh, for that uh, small moment in their day. The caveats about loss and grief process are that of course it's idiosyncratic and unique, meaning that there are many variables at home culture, at school culture, communication uh, patterns that we use, uh, but it is unique to that child and the uh, home and school culture that they come from. It is a non-linear sequential process. So that's lovely. I put it all in boxes, uh, but it doesn't occur like that. Uh, it, it actually can, uh, there's no exact order or sequence to it. It can reoccur. And so all you have to think about there is triggers, things that happen that remind one of something that has changed, remind them of something that is lost. I heard a child say the other day, we used to go every Friday after school for ice cream. We can't go anymore. Um, because the store closed down, it just didn't survive. Um, the last one, uh, so all three of these at the top, uh, you know, is uh, everyone is different uh, in what, how that occurs and what can be a trigger and what they are experiencing at what point in the process. The last one though, I think is critical for all children uh, that they have a sense of hope throughout, no matter where they are in dealing with this. Um, we all need to hear and see hope. Uh, so sometimes uh, I call them keeping phrases in my pocket, uh, just so I'm ready to use them when a child says, or I notice, I see you're sad, or I see you're frustrated. Uh, why don't you tell me about it? Uh, so that's validating their emotions. That's allowing self-expression. And then at the same time, uh, assuring them, well, we're going to be okay, or what can we do about this? Uh, we will get through this together. Again, signaling hope, signaling you're not alone uh, in this. Um, and sometimes even I see caregivers, parents, and teachers alike saying, I feel the same way. Uh, and it helps and encourages children to uh, do that self-expression. If you're wondering or scratching your head, do you really think this is important? Uh, this is a graphic from Harvard University Center on developing uh, the developing child. Um, and I think it's incredibly important, this childhood bereavement model. There are a couple of links down there that you could go to to read more about it, learn more about it. But if you look at the left-hand column, the grief-related adversity, what I want you to note is the loss of community and the list of all the adversity and uh, even the adversity that's there. Some of you named these at the very beginning of this conversation on the webinar. Uh, but all the support that children have lost when school became virtual school uh, or went away, all of the um, challenges for families of financial strain, of relocation uh, when jobs went away or their housing went away, uh, and issues related to anxiety, which of course, if you've kept up with this, uh, is also its own, if you will, pandemic of um, mental health uh, crises, not only in this country, but around the world. 
So uh, there is a grief related adversity if we don't attend to this, um, the cost of inaction. But if you look at the right hand side and I draw your attention to the light blue box at the bottom, the protective factors which can strengthen uh, a child's capacity to cope uh, when they are healthy. So eating and sleeping, when they have strong relationships with family and friends, when they are encouraged and supported by family, friends, teachers, neighbors, all of these can minimize the disruption in development. All of these can support healthy development. So it's a really important thing that we attend to. Um, and that means you, you are one of those protective factors. If you are interfacing with children and with families and all the ways that you can help support them navigate this moment. Uh, so people often ask me, what do you do? How do you start? And I often say this, that the first thing I think you need to do is step back. So remember when you're riding a plane and they say, uh, first put on your oxygen mask before you help another uh, person next to you, um, that we really do need to look at ourselves uh, and take care of ourselves. So I usually uh, have uh, suggested to um, teachers that I've worked with that you think about how do you handle loss and grief? What are your own strengths and limitations? And how are you taking care of yourself? Uh, all of these will impact your capacity to support and respond to children and families. Um, secondly, you need to identify resources and utilize them, but being very specific about ones that match a child's needs and their interests. Uh, so I, you'll have a handout that's got many, many resources for you to go to, through. It's probably overwhelming, but you really should look at those with children, specific children in mind and think, what is it that really will best match their age, their particular circumstance? Obviously implement strategies that are matched to a child. We're gonna talk about a few of those in the uh, next couple of slides. Um, and then uh, identify on the front end, I like to do this, uh, professional support that we will need to utilize. So whether that's a social worker, a counselor, uh, who are the supports at the school and uh, community that uh, you need to have, um, already have contact information about. So the first thing you need to consider when you're thinking about strategies is what is typical for the child uh, or student in your class. Uh, when a behavior or a personality trait is different than what it was before, it's often a sign that the child might be struggling. And in fact, the National Alliance for Grieving Children encourage parents and teachers alike to think about and take notice of uh, changes in a child's temperament, changes in their personality, changes in their behavior. So a child who was outgoing has suddenly become withdrawn or a child who was strong, independent and motivated now is no longer motivated to do anything without uh, strong supports. As you look at that child, um, we often say, uh, is it uh, something that is a red flag that may signal that you need to seek uh, professional support? Yes, I as a teacher or parent can do some things, but maybe this child actually needs um, greater support than what I can offer. Uh, so just to give you a sense of it, I'm not going to read through this list. Uh, you can, you obviously can do that. But over time, most of us, even in a transition, we adapt to a new normal, right? We get used to uh, settling in uh, to a, the transition. But sometimes, especially if the loss is traumatic, a child's behavior may seem severe or last for a longer amount of time than you would anticipate. So it would be important to look for these red flags uh, so that you know uh, when to reach out to mental health professionals. And it doesn't hurt to go ahead and reach out to them uh, before you even uh, conclude that. Uh, they would more than likely help you conclude that. So if I have any concern at all, um, I am at the ready to contact someone uh, who's a professional in the field. Having said that, there are so many things that you can do. And so these are examples uh, which shouldn't surprise you uh, that you can um, promote understanding and give them support to grieve, help them commemorate and move forward, 
uh, by doing some of these things, establishing a new routine with the child. And I said, with the child. So helping them uh, think about uh, their previous school experience and maybe sprinkling in some things from their previous schedule to the present schedule uh, to give uh, a sense of security for that child. Obviously being, import, being consistent is important with routines, but that's equally important to build in flexibility especially in this moment. Uh, we all need to have the capacity to bend and be flexible. Uh, and you are modeling that for children when you do that. Uh, so it's important in these unusual times, I think, uh, to have a consistent routine, but also to balance that with taking breaks and being flexible and building in child choice. I cannot stress that enough because as we all know, a child, when they have choice, uh, empowers the child. It gives them a sense of control over some aspect of their world. So important. So if a child uh, says, I want to do story time first, uh, or several children do, because that's where they left off with on the day before, um, you know, and there's no harm in doing that, of really providing some small ways throughout their day uh, to do that. And uh, the last one on here, if there's any, nothing we've learned in the last 12 to 16 months, it is the importance of being present and available to children. Your presence offers a sense of stability and safety, um, you know, as they're dealing with all the changes that they are facing. Um, and so uh, we can reconfigure ways to be present to children as people have done so well on uh, virtual um, platforms. Uh, but having ongoing conversations with children, checking in with them. I asked some teachers the other day, uh, how is this working for them? And they said, well, you know, we used to have morning check-in and end of day check-in, whether that was a half day or a full day. And they said, now I check in a little bit more uh, and I check in with family members a little bit more uh, throughout the, um, the week. And so really being present uh, to children and families. Always remembering children are individuals and their grief is too. Some wanna to talk about it, others don't. Uh, some uh, have certain responses to grief, um, such as um, feeling frustrated, feeling depressed. Others seem to adapt and move through it easily. So it's important not to make assumptions, uh, but actually get into that child's world and understand where they are in the grief process. Uh, and most of all, it's important to let them know, of course, uh, that you're there for them when and if they want to talk about it. What's up? How's it going? And let the conversation go. Uh, they really do need that self-expression. And when they do talk about it, I think this slide is so important, the first bullet point. Answering questions, of course, at the level that they can understand with words that they understand without providing too much information or information they actually didn't ask for. Um, and so the second one, anticipating the next change, foreshadowing that uh, brings about a sense of calm. Uh, if you're reactive, of course, that's the cue, they'll be reactive. So really taking their cues from you to say, we have something a little different this morning uh, and we're gonna move right through that. Affirming all emotions that they have um, and sense of safety and well-being such as thank you for telling me and showing me how you feel. I feel that way too, but we'll get through this. What can we do together? Again, I'm employing self-choice, praise, and those little breaks and rewards that we all need. I jumped over one, but I wanna emphasize that of managing that environment and minimizing exposure to the 24 hour news cycle. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think in classrooms people have that on the TV or whatever, but there's conversation among the adults uh, in the programs, and uh, they really need to manage that away from uh, and have those conversations away from children uh, so that the conversation for children focuses on all the presence uh, moments that they are doing and activities in the classroom. Sure, addressing things as children bring them up, uh, but actually not interjecting those uh, from our own, uh, if you will, adult conversation and adult world. Um, we don't have time to go through these, so I'm gonna flash through them very quickly, uh, but I just wanna uh, draw attention to this. There are about three or four slides in here, and you can go to www.field.org, um, that link at the bottom 
to really uh, address children's emotional literacy. If ever there was a perfect uh, time to do that, it would be now uh, where uh, children are learning uh, to perceive and communicate their emotions. Um, and um, when there is a lot of emotion going around related to loss and grief, it uh, really lends itself to a perfect opportunity to be able to identify, understand, and respond to emotions, not only within them, but of other people in healthy manner. Um, so um, this is the only slide I'll go over with this and uh, then we'll move on. Um, but these are probably one of the most critical things that children need to know. And even we as adults need to be reminded of that emotions change uh, in children. And so you could be feeling one way in this moment uh, that you didn't ever feel that way before. I used to not be scared in the dark at night, but now I am, a child said to me. You can have more than one emotion at a time. I'm excited about going to school and anxious. You can feel differently than someone else, your brother or sister or friend. But most important, all emotions are valid. It actually is what you do about with them. So um, you feel sad, you feel disappointed, you feel angry, that's okay. All of those are okay. It's not okay to hit someone, to bite or kick someone, as we all know that. So it's really important that we both va validate the emotion, but also problem solve with children about healthy responses to all those emotions they might be feeling. These are just two slides. I'm gonna uh, skip over them, but uh, they really stress how do you use uh, body language uh, in this time in our life when uh, many of us may still be wearing masks that interfere with communication. So really practicing this with children of uh, using your eyes and body language, adjusting your voice uh, and playing guessing games of what are my emotions when children have masks. If you look at those pictures up at the top, look at everything that you get from those children's pictures when you see a full face. It just shows you a lot that we have missing. So this is a great time uh, to work on that or practice reading and expressing body language within your classroom or within a home setting. So I had a teacher show me these visual supports and said, now we use this class wide uh, so that it's very easy to communicate uh, with one another. I love this, it was just a, a wonderful idea. It's also a new a moment where you can learn a new way to express yourself. And here is an ASL nook. It's only a three minute video that classrooms could use or you could send it home for families to use that uh, actually has no words to it, uh, but one adult modeling a sign uh, and two or three children imitating it. And what you'll notice in the video is it's very easy to follow because no one's uh, wearing a mask, but then uh, I would suggest trying it uh, both wearing a mask and then uh, without a mask uh, to practice that. So all of those are related to, uh, to emotional literacy. Uh, there are many, many books uh, and online resources and the three uh, uh, sources down here at the bottom, NAYC, uh, CEPHAL and the National Association for School Psychologists all have materials out there uh, for you to help you navigate this using children's literature. I love the book Nook. It provides a book as well uh, that you can read with children uh, and then activities that are uh, linked to that, uh, that book. Okay, Whew, I'm zooming through. I hope you're hanging in there with me uh, as we wind down here. Um, this is one of my favorite pages of what are the actual activities that you can do. And there are just so many. So I just uh, picked a few to put on this page. Uh, but the most important thing, of course, is matching them to the child's interests and needs. Um, and so all of these are examples of things that could be utilized uh, to help children express themselves. Uh, as we all know, dramatic play, puppet play, pretend play, art, uh, those have a long history of self-expression. Sometimes we don't think about motor and yoga, but uh, some children need a more active way to uh, express themselves. Uh, even gardening I uh, found to be particularly useful. I heard teachers and parents alike talking about this, that it not only uh, has known to have a restorative power uh, for all ages, because it's physically active and all the benefits that you get from that, 
but uh, the actual act of planting seeds is a signal for hope and then taking care of plants uh, as they grow and develop. And so uh, also a, a great tool um, and uh, some classes I know they went on and planted gardens and now they still keep up those gardens. Um, and before they had community gardens so they couldn't go there together. So they had a schedule where they would all go at different times and take care of the garden, really cool ideas. Uh, mindfulness and gratitude exercises as well. And uh, even one uh, school told me about a gratitude garden that they had planted. So whew, it, we've covered a lot, but I wanna recap a, cu a couple of things um, or at least one thing before I go to the next slide. Remember, these are the tasks that children are working on in a grief process, understanding, grieving, commemorating, and moving forward. And I don't know about you, but I find it helpful, uh, maybe as uh, because long time being a special ed teacher of creating action steps that go with each of these. So gathering resources that support a child's understanding and identifying ones that match that child. Even you attending this webinar could be considered an action step that you've taken uh, to support a child's understanding. Looking through all the books that are out there and videos and finding ones that match your children's needs um, and their uh, current situation. Uh, the task of grieving, remembering to validate all of those emotions and support their emotional literacy. Uh, so, so important. Finding something, whether that's a product or an activity that commemorates what has happened and have children generate these together. Remember child choice in this, memory books, time capsules, uh, a photo diary or journal with dictated stories even thank you notes uh, to teachers and nurses and so on. And remember Kessler's work on moving forward. Children need to move forward. Uh, they need to uh, make meaningful, uh, find a meaningful way to integrate this into their lives in a way that is healthy. So I know some parents talked about they started the garden, they are continuing the garden and now at the school as well. Or they had weekend family game nights and some schools had weekend family uh, game nights with uh, teachers involved as well. And I've heard some teachers continuing that uh, as well. So finding uh, ways that you continue uh, family activities uh, and school activities that help children uh, move forward. In the last uh, few minutes, looks like we have um, on this webinar, I just wanted to touch base about this one um, activity that you could do. Um, at the end of the day, at the beginning of a day, um, this might be a wonderful way for children to think about um, what they have gone through. Um, I think it's a way of moving forward when one expresses gratitude. Uh, naming things that we are grateful for, of course, does not dismiss, not at all, uh, or invalidate the very real losses that we have. But rather, when we think about the losses and the tasks that children have to work through and process, gratitude activities can be thought of as taking small steps forward, coming to terms with all that has happened, not just the losses uh, that we have experienced, but other aspects of life that we maybe now have a different or new or greater uh, appreciation uh, for or about. Uh, so I'm just going to hit on a couple of these that are up here on this graphic. You see links below that can tell you the benefits of this. And the last one is a video, a child's video uh, about uh, gratitude. But what research has shown us is that it can improve your physical health, uh, that those uh, who express gratitude have fewer aches and pains and generally have a feeling of better health and exercise more regularly. It enhances empathy and reduces aggression towards other children. It improves sleep. You sleep longer and you sleep better. Um, also research has shown that, I, I don't have time to go through each of these, but I'll hit on the last one too. It improves our mental strength, children's mental strength. So uh, people that are grateful have an advantage in overcoming trauma and enhanced resilience helping them back, bounce back, if you will, 
from highly stressful situations or bounce back a little bit more easily. Uh, if you want to read more about these, um, they are two links down there. But I want to take the last minute that we have here or two just to ask you, is there this question to the left? Is there something that during this pandemic that, uh, or as a result of it, you've become uh, more grateful for um, during the pandemic or as a result of that? I'm just wondering, um, anybody, you can turn your mic on. Um, um, you know, or you can put it in the chat box. Um, I'll ch click on the chat box too, just to see. Um, someone wrote human interactions with friends, going to school, the many things that I used to take uh, for granted. Same with me, honestly. Um, anybody else? things you are grateful for. Someone wrote Lee. I don't know if that's a, a child or... No, anybody? My therapist, my teaching team, learning to be content at home. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, family, I love that one, family time. Uh, I feel the same way. Family dinners. I love that. Y'all are going to make me start crying. <laughs> uh, like you, I've become so grateful for so many uh, things, but also uh, people. Um, you know, I always appreciated parents um, and my coworkers and uh, teachers. And I, wow, uh, I have so much more appreciation for the role that they play in children's lives. Um, so that has, for me, been heightened in a very big way. Um, I have a lot greater appreciation of nature because I had to stay home like many of you and actually just watch nature go by. Uh, but there are so many uh, things that um, I'm much more attuned to. Um, and I could put very simple things like the mailman, which is not a simple thing, or the grocery store clerks, all the people that were out there providing services for us. Um, so it's a great way to uh, close this session. Um, I would like to say um, in closing, thank you for joining me today. Please feel free to email me with follow-up questions. I know I flew through uh, this content rather quickly. But I hope you leave today with some new information, maybe new ideas, new energy uh, for supporting uh, children. Um, I see a thank you from Janelle. Thank you all for attending. It means a lot to me uh, because I, I'd like to think there's a ripple effect uh, that you're out there uh, with children on the front line with them. And so you're awesome for doing that. So thank you so much. And in the meantime, I uh, hope you stay safe and healthy. And I see all the kudos. Thank you all. You've been great. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, Karen.